Hello and welcome to Then and Now, where I, AJ, the comic archivist, talk about a comic book title from the very first issue up to the latest number one in that franchise, with a brief history somewhere in between. Now I do have a backlog of episodes if you want to support the channel, as well as figure out what the hell I do on this. There's a new Spider-Man movie coming out, and I too have returned from a multiversal crossover epic that left me retired until one of my clones stopped being popular. We are going to be talking about the Tangled Web of the Spider-Man comics today. No, not the actual Tangled Web title. Obviously, this is going to be the flagship, the starter, Amazing Spider-Man. However, that wasn't the beginning for the webhead. In my videos, I have made many jibes about the fact that Stan Lee was a great ideas guy and business-minded but was only ever as good as the person he decided to cling to, not unlike a Lamprey or Joss Whedon. But in the 60s, he was the spearhead of the shift for superhero comics into their next evolution, as it were. Essentially, Lee wanted to have a melodrama with a superhero lead. And if you're thinking that sounds like a no-brainer by now, remember, comic books were primarily an extension of pulp magazines, and a top seller was drama and romance comics. I don't see it as a great visionary move, but going, why not try to double sales by combining superheroes that boys love and the melodrama that girls love? Uh, there's a rant buried in there, but to make a long story short, which is a running theme for this, Lee wanted to create a superhero that dealt with real world issues and would have a continuing storyline between issues, but it absolutely needed to be a teenager, since it was the major demographic they were going for but wouldn't be a boy, at least in title. He'd be a man, to denote how serious and realistic the story is. Yes, hilariously, Marvel's big rise to being one of the big two in the comic and, well, universe as it is right now, was because it decided to go grimdark. Well, for the 60s, grimdark. Oh, and fun fact, Jack Kirby was originally approached to draw him, but Lee felt that his art was too larger than life, and that made Spider-Man look too godlike. So he went with Steve Didko to keep Puny Parker more ordinary. Regardless, the publisher at the time, Martin Goodman, hated the concept. But he did allow for that Spidey hyphen man to debut in the final issue of Amazing Fantasy with issue 15. And then Goodman ate those words because the issue was a hit and Lee would then be approached to write an entire run for that character. The title being known as The Amazing Spider-Man and the rest is history. Seriously though, the rest is history because Amazing Spider-Man Volume 1 ran from 1962 to issue 441 in November of 1998. It is that run that everyone knows about for the most part. Everything was introduced. Dr. Octopus, Green Goblin, The Sinister Six, Chameleon, in fact Chameleon's in the first issue, The Symbiote Suit and Venom, The Death of Gwen Stacy, His Marriage to Mary Jane Watson, and the first death of Aunt May, the Cologne Saga, the weird Where Is Spider-Man story that was just because Peter didn't have a spare outfit at the time. Uh, no, none of those events are actually in chronological order. But everything that you think about when it comes to Spider-Man was introduced here. Except, of course, post-millennium introductions would make people think he had organic web shooters and wasn't a smart boy who made his own because of Sam Raimi, which then led into the comics, but either way. Volume 2 would launch in January of 1999, but it would return to the original numbering at a waiter Spider-Man's powers magic-based story arc, and Peter would actually become a teacher at his old high school. There's actually a lot that happens in this volume that generally has gotten retconned thanks to the bomb of a plotline, One More Day. Now, it is a common storyline brought up about Spidey, and even now, 20 years later, still kind of is a major dividing point for Spidey fans. Once again, long story short, after Spidey reveals his identity in the Civil War storyline, Aunt May gets shot, so Peter makes a deal with the devil to erase his marriage to Mary Jane so that Aunt May will live and the world forgets that he's Spider-Man. But even tanking sales couldn't kill Spider-Man. No, what actually kills Spider-Man happened in the massive finale to this version of Amazing Spider-Man, in the Dying Wish story, where Doc Octopus, who had died a while back and came back and all that, switches bodies with Peter Parker, and in issue 700, Peter Parker is killed while he's in Doc Ock's body, ending the Amazing Spider-Man series, and it kind of relaunched as Superior Spider-Man, with Doc Ock's consciousness in Peter's body being the focus point, and Doc Ock's adventures being Spider-Man. 
Now, the reason I said kind of a relaunch is because it is dealer's choice for some people that Superior should be lumped in with Amazing, since the dual numbering that's been going on does count Superior as Amazing number 701 through 733. But in 2014, Amazing Spider-Man does officially return with point issues, uh, 700.1 through 0.5, dealing with the Goblin Nation storyline and the triumphant return of Peter Parker's mind back into his body. So, April 2014 saw the official relaunch of Amazing Spider-Man with Peter Parker. In that year, there were so many tie-ins, crossovers, and the epic scale of Spider-Verse that it really didn't feel like a back-to-basics as it was kind of meant to be at the start. Which also explains why Amazing Spider-Man Renew Your Vows which came out as a tie-in alternate thing from the screw it, let's bring back everything the readers have ever wanted for a couple issues anyways, event that was Secret Wars, which had the legacy numbering of ASM 752 through 756. After that whole thing, Marvel did another relaunch of essentially all of their titles with another all-new, all-different Marvel event, which was just another banner to grab new readers since the Rise of Superhero films was drawing interest. That at least kept a focus on Peter Parker's life proper, with tie-ins feeling much more natural, and it goes until Dan Slott's final issue, and the final issue of this volume, number 801. And finally, that brings us to the latest volume of Amazing Spider-Man in 2018. Hilariously, this was part of the Fresh Start relaunch, which was essentially to pretend that there was a status quo after the Marvel Legacy event backpedaled after all new all different didn't get the audience reaction they wanted, but the point is is that that's going to be where we are now. Well, now being about three years and 50 issues ago. Now, yes, I know that this is the most abridged history of the Amazing Spider-Man title anyone has ever given ever. If I went full reader's history on this, then I'd be here for the next six months before I even getting to the 80s. I mean, I haven't even finished the reader's history of Cloak and Dagger, and that's not even a long haul. So now that we know the history of the whole thing, let's go back to 1962 with... Amazing Spider-Man number 1, written by Stan Lee, art by Steve Ditko, and while credited as Johnny D and John Duffy, no not that John Duffy, is letterer John D'Agostino. So, what's the first panel of the first solo comic for Spider-Man? Him doing what he would do for the next 70 plus years. Whining and yelling all edgy and angsty-like. It does actually naturally get us into a reintroduction of his origins, and yes, I know it's well known by now, but hey, it is a comic book staple for a reason. So, his origins go down like this. He was bitten by a radioactive spider, and his first thought was to dress in bright red and blue and go into showbiz. While he's busy selling out, an armed robber breaks into Uncle Ben and Aunt May's house just to shoot Uncle Ben, and have Peter Parker switch from showboating to go after the robber and does some good vigilante justice to turn him into the police. Now, it is a solid heroing origin, without being, and now I must become a superhero. He's still technically not in the start of his own series. Peter Zanks then gets interrupted, or exacerbated by, rather, walking in on Aunt May telling the landlord that she'll pay the rent next week. See, Uncle Ben was making the money, so they're now broke. Naturally, Peter is all gung-ho about quitting school to get a job, not like he was already doing school and the Spider-Man shows. So... Nope. He starts down the train of thought that any teen would with superhero powers. He has powers unlike anyone that he knows, outside of the Fantastic Four and all that, so he could do anything and get away with it. Steal the money because who could stop him, rather? But then we do actually see why that train of thought gets derailed, and it is a good one. Emotions. He's a very emotional boy, after all. So, he goes back to square, I've gotta go do my shows to make money. Now, before we go into how stupid he can be there, we do get a quick shot of him playing with science while his classmates talk about going to see the Spider-Man show. Puny Parker ain't got no friends. And also, no sense, because after the show that night, he can't be paid in cash due to tax reasons, So, to protect his identity, he lets the manager give him a check made out to Spider-Man. Even the manager says that he's going to have a hard time cashing it. Yes, the same brilliant mind that's able to make his own web shooters, and later on gadgets, totally feels that he can cash a check because it's made out to Spider-Man, and he's dressed as Spider-Man. Smart don't mean not dumb. Although, 
it's New York in 1960s, so there's actually probably a few different places he could have gone to get that cashed. Just saying. So yeah, obviously that doesn't work, but what's worse is that his upcoming shows have actually been cancelled. But who could do such a thing? None other than the king of cancel culture himself, J. Jonah Jameson. Now, in this issue, Triple J is raining media hell on Spider-Man for being a public menace due to vigilantism, which was the one time at this stage in his career. But to push that narrative, or be topical to the point of repetition, Jameson also brings up that kids may try to imitate his feats and hurt themselves. Instead, all the little children should look up to real heroes, like Triple J's son, John, who is a test pilot who is also about to orbit the Earth in a rocket. The irony there being that John would later on become Manwolf. Peter Parker sees Aunt May pawning some jewelry to make ends meet, and Petey has a hissy about needing to man up and stalk the night as Spider-Man to earn money. Somehow. The next day, with nothing better to do, Peter Parker goes to watch the launch of John Jameson's Orbiter. But oh no, something goes wrong! Having failed to use a net to catch the out-of-control Orbiter, because that's how science works, there's only one option for young Peter Parker, and that is to dress as Spider-Man. Spidey goes to the launch control, gets the missing unit that's making the orbiter go out of control, with J. Jonah Jameson bashing him the entire time. Spider-Man then commandeers a plane and a pilot to catch up with the orbiter, webs over to it, and saves the day. Of course, the Daily Bugle headline the following day after that is all about how Spider-Man should be arrested and prosecuted for doing whatever he did. And there's even a reward for his capture. Dejected by society, Peter broods as he will brood for the next 75 years, society hating him. However, there's a second story in this issue, and it begins with Peter making the smart call to try and join the Fantastic Four to make money. Hilarious side note, you'll notice that Peter Parker's name is misprinted as Peter Palmer throughout the entire second half of this story. Fun! Anyway, Spidey tries to sneak into the Fantastic Four offices in broad daylight with a crowd of people watching, and triggers their silent alarm, which means, cue up the hero v hero fight. Sadly though, he finds out that they're actually a not-for-profit, so they can't pay him anything, and so he quickly leaves. Meanwhile, Spidey's first villain reads about the manhunt for Spider-Man, and decides that since Spidey is already wanted, he'd be the perfect person to impersonate, and that's what the chameleon does. However, he also gives a message to Spider-Man to get him to the crime location so that the cops can chase him while he's getting away on his helicopter, not knowing that Peter Palmer has mastered all sorts of web tricks to catch him before the chameleon can reach his Soviet sub. Huh. Long story short, after a quick mix-up, the cops arrest the chameleon and Spidey escapes into the night, crying like the man-baby he is. Well, I mean, he's a teen, so at least it's somewhat understandable that he's all angsty-like. The first issue here of Amazing Spider-Man is, of its time might be the most diplomatic way of saying it. There is a massive amount of staples that would stick with the character, like the absolutely hostile relationship between Spider-Man and the press, mostly the Daily Bugle. We don't learn the true reason for Jameson's absolute hatred for Spider-Man until much later, with a few comics coming out to try and be a bridge between Amazing Fantasy number 15 and Amazing Spider-Man number 1, with varying degrees of success. Similarly, while Stan Lee's initial idea would be that Spider-Man would grow up alongside readers, he never really grows out of that angsty mood swing thing, which becomes slightly more cartoony later in life, like after college when he's married to a supermodel, crying about how his life is so unfair. But that does lead to the number one rule that always carried alongside Peter Parker. He is a broke joke. And in that terrible segue, I too am a broke joke. Doing these sorts of videos over a decade off and on hasn't actually helped outside of that stint with what culture. But hey, you at home can help. The most costly would be to buy us a coffee over on Kofi, which also means you get to pick the title for the next then and now, or even bring back shows like The Winds and Sins of Comics. However, the most helpful thing you can do for free is to like, share, subscribe, leave a comment, and do all the good things that make the great algorithm notice us. Personally, just watching is a wonder and I thank you. But now, onward to the present day of Spider-Man. Okay, the now is still three years ago, but this is Amazing Spider-Man 2018, volume like 
Six or seven, depending on who you ask. Written by Nick Spencer, art by Ryan Otley, inks by Cliff Rathburn, and letters by VCs Joe Caramagna. It begins with a dream of Peter Parker and Mary Jane Watson together. Yes, One More Day did happen a while before this, but they still aren't a couple or really dating so far as I remember. But part of the deal with the devil was that they both remember their life together, so it does lead to some interesting teasing to the reader like this over the last decade or so. Luckily, before the dream can get all Tracy Scops up in here, Peter gets jolted awake thanks to one of his roommates. And yes, Peter Parker has a couple roommates now, which makes sense given the cost of living in New York City. One is Randy Robertson, the son of Robbie Robertson, head of the Daily Bugle. The other is Fred Myers, costumed villain Boomerang, which actually really does help with paying the rent. After those intros, though, we cut over to the Avengers, Guardians of the Galaxy, and X-Men Red, the best X-Book in the last five years, fighting off a random alien invasion. Spidey comes in to help everybody, but he just gets the cold shoulder, and we then abruptly cut over to a few weeks ago. Long story short, the Kingpin is the mayor of New York City, and he's been going after all costumed heroes, all except Spider-Man, who he's decided to give the key to the city because reasons. Well, the actual reason is that he's trying to get Spider-Man isolated from the superhero community to hurt him. But it is Spider-Man, so he'd isolate himself and brood in the rain if Hawkeye ate one of his drumsticks. Then there's a scene where Peter Parker covers a news story about a new anti-plagiarism technology since students at ESU were using transdimensional ways to get papers, or they were reading the minds of their peers and stealing them that way. I will admit that I actually think this is a really neat way to smack down Peter Parker because they use Watcher, that super cool new anti-plagiarism tech, on a paper that Peter wrote as a grad student, which determined that the paper was actually written by Dr. Otto Octavius. Because, yeah, that was all during the Superior Spider-Man phase. So it was Otto who wrote it. This also leads to Peter Parker being fired from the Daily Bugle because now he's branded a liar by everybody. He's a fraud. Then there's a scene to catch up on his and Mary Jane's relationship after that, which was basically just a way to say that she knows he's Spider-Man and they're really besties still, and they talk. Then that leads to Peter being reminded of Aunt May finding out, going to their apartment, and stealing her newspaper. The fool! Printed media is dead! And Aunt May actually has news alerts on her phone about any article that has his name in it. She's absolutely devastated about this whole fraud thing, and feels that her and Uncle Ben raised Peter better than this, and she storms off. So all of that was flashback while intercut between the alien invasion shtick. But Spidey notices that the portals are all interconnected, and he's going to do what he always does, that self-destructive, in the name of good, I'll sacrifice myself to stop them. And I wish he did, because he gives uh, Black Hat a bye Felicia before he does. Yeesh. But the bigger joke on the reader is that this is all actually a Mysterio trick. That actually makes it a lot easier for Spidey to kick his butt and get him webbed up for the other people to arrest him. Now, all of that was just so Peter could get the nudge of stop doing the same thing and expect different results so he can go and give a heartfelt speech, which is legitimately really good. Good enough so that Mary Jane kisses him because they're in this entire thing together as it's always been. Like many modern first issues, this is the writer trying to clear the board for his own story and interpretation of what Spider-Man should be going forward. Spencer does it very well. But it also denotes something that does trouble Spider-Man as a character since his inception. I brought it up in the title's history that there were about 440 issues of the first run of Amazing Spider-Man. But in that time, a lot of growth any long-term writer would give Peter Parker would oftentimes be negated by a new writer. So this isn't a Spencer-specific issue, and honestly, given how insane the turn of the century has been for Peter Parker, taking away the cushy lifestyle, the great office, and essentially bringing him back to basics, as the opening story name would suggest, is actually a fantastic thing to bring back all the elements that made Peter Parker different than, say, Daredevil or the Fantastic Four. When I started this series, the then and now series, I initially envisioned it as an old versus new kind of thing, where I'd bring up the qualities that both bring to the table, and when it comes to the series such as Amazing Spider-Man, or previously with the Lois Lane episode, the shifts in storytelling from the Silver Age to now creates a massive friction point. 
The original ASM had two stories going on, both culminating in the sad sack Parker ostracized and against the ropes. In 2018, this is part one of a story that is designed to get him back to treading water, but without a single scene of him punching a wall like a total chad, or a roommate that'd be mainlining Call of Duty Latveria at 5 in the morning. So I guess the final answer to this comparison is that Spider-Man began life as a character who was meant to grow and evolve with the stories told, and yet give anyone half a century, there is no more room for growth. Those that take the helm have the stories they want to tell because of their interpretations of that character, and that will always turn the clock back to where they feel was, and then build forward from that until the next person comes in, and the cycle generally repeats. I mean, even my own time with the character was the early 80s, which would ideally spend two pages on action, ten pages on character interaction, and then ten pages on Peter Parker moping and monologuing to himself. Now, I know that may be a disappointing conclusion to come up with for those that wanted me to rail on about one more day like every other Spider-Man talk has to be, or Nick Spencer's more infamous work. But come on, I already have an article that may be more loathed than Nick Spencer ever could be. I just didn't have job security enough to bitch about it on Twitter. In all seriousness, though, the original Spider-Man run is dated, and the modern one is another restart, but both are very much worth reading. In this specific context, Spider-Man in single issues isn't actually that spectacular, because it's all about the overall story being told, be it in multi-issue stories like now, or in standalone character pieces like in The Then. And on that bombshell, that's the end of the video. If you agree, disagree, or just want to add your own two cents on the comics talked about, leave a comment below. While you're down there, let me know what you'd like to see on the next Then and Now, or any of the other shows we have on this channel. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and please consider supporting us on Ko-fi. All of that is in the description below. More than anything, though, thank you for watching. I'm AJ Carey, the Comic Archivist, and stay gold, Inklings.